The most powerful king of the Middle Kingdom was Sesostris III. Sesostris III, what were his domestic policies? So he completed building the Amun Temple. Um, he introduced new festivals, so for example, the festival of the dead of Osiris, and he reconstructed Abydos, so the kings, the, where the, kings, uh, the tombs of the kings were, which was destroyed in the first intermediate period. And he also renewed the pyramid building tradition. After the old kingdom, the pyr pyramid building was stopped, but now he started it again, and we can also see his pyramid today, it is the pyramid of Sesostris III, also in Dashur. We can visit this pyramid also. But we see, when we, look at, we, when we take a look at the statue of Sesostris III, we see that his face is different from statues of other Egyptian kings. So there are three main differences. First, he has really big ears much bigger than the other kings. They're really standing out when we look at his statue. Then, most Egyptian kings, when they make statues of themselves, they are either smiling because they want to show that under uh, their rule, everything is fine, or they don't have a mimic at all in order to show their power and their mightiness. But it is different with Sesostris III. He has a sad face. And this shows that uh, during his reign, although he was such a powerful king, that there was clearly a problem in the land. And the third thing is he has sunken eyes. This shows this, that, um, again, also this shows that he has, uh, he, there's so, there are some problems in his land and that um, and these problems um, are, seem to be so strong that he has sunken eyes that he didn't get much sleep and that he had many worries about his country as a king who wants to care for his country and then we can ask our, uh, when to we ask ourselves can this be a famine or can this be a hunger crisis so today in the archaeology uh, we assume that in his time there might be su such kind of a famine of, or a hunger crisis. And in this way, so in this time of crisis, um, we believe that um, he is presented with a worrying face in order to be remembered as somebody who cared for his people, who worried about his people and therefore in this time of crisis thought about how his people and how his country could survive and um, therefore he is uh, always presented in a worried state. We will come back to that later. Regarding culture, this was also a very flourishing time. Um, for example, we have from this time the Medicine Papyrus of Cahun or the Edwin Smith Papyrus these are um, papyri, papyri about uh, medical topics, uh, from veterinary medicine to gynecology, everything is there. And then also in regarding the economy, this was also a flourishing time, because you had mining and quarries in Fayun, and then in Wadi Hamamat, you had a really big gold industry. Um, when we take a closer look at the map, here is Thebes, and here is the uh, Red Sea, and here is the Wadi Hamamat, and along that, Egypt had gold industry. And then from the Sinai, you have also uh, copper or turquoise. Um, there were also many factories there. So how can we relate Sesostris III to the Bible? In this time, we believe that Joseph lived. This also makes sense when we calculate it from Abraham to Joseph. We land about eight, um, Jacob and his sons living about 1900 to 1800 um, BC. And we believe that Joseph was probably the vizier of Sesostris III. Because during Joseph's time, when Joseph was the vizier, we read there was also a big famine. Seven years, uh, seven, seven years, fruitful years, and then seven years of famine. And then Joseph cared about the Egyptians, 
And because Joseph cared about the Egyptians, the Egyptian king could also be indirectly a, care, a caretaker for his people through Joseph, caring for the Egyptians and giving them the food in this time of famine. We read in Genesis, therefore we read in Genesis chapter 41 and 42, during, during the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. And then when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt in this time of famine. And then from the um, um, documentary, A Pattern of Evidence, this is a documentary of Exodus that somebody might, some of you might know, um, there is some evidence that exactly in this time um, uh, there was this famine and there was Joseph um, being the one uh, who was the vizier at that time. So these are um, some screenshots from the, f um, from the documentary pattern of evidence. Um, for example, this here, um, uh, this is from Avaris. Avaris is a city in Goshen, in the, in the Nile Delta, where um, the Egyptians lived. And there we see um, w w there, were, there were found in the ruins 12 tombs, 11 tombs, normal tombs, and then one small pyramid. And there was found a small, uh, a big statue, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which showed that this statue was not typically Egyptian, but it was from uh, Palestine and Mesopotamic descent. And therefore, we assume today that this statue might be the statue of Joseph and the place where he was buried. Another sign that in this time Joseph lived was that everything belonged to the Pharaoh. Genesis chapter 47, 20 says, the land became, became Pharaoh's. And indeed, we see that while the statues of the local rulers became smaller, the statues of the king became greater. This shows that there was more power and uh, concentrated on the Egyptian king at that time. So there's, uh, there's still some open discussions, but what we can say about Joseph is that exactly in this time, God used Joseph as a great deliverance, as Genesis chapter 45, 7 says. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So God used one person, Joseph, as a great deliverance for a whole nation, for the Egyptians, and for the 12 stems of Israel, for Jacob's sons, to save them from the famine and lead them to Egypt. And in this way, God could continue his great promise, um, promise, so the line to Jesus through Judah, and God could also fulfill his promise on the forefathers in Egypt, making uh, their descendants into a great people, the chosen people of Israel. But also this kingdom declined. The 12th dynasty lasted about 750 BC, but after that, there came, there came a few more dynasties, but um, all the kings, they were not able to keep up the order in the country. Zobik Neferu was a woman, um, but shortly after her crowning, she was deposed. And this is the first time where actually a woman was a king. And, um, but the Egyptians, Egyptians disposed her um, from being a king because they thought Horus, so Egyptian kings were all descendants of Horus, and Horus was the son, not the daughter, the son of Osiris. So they thought a woman sitting on the uh, throne of Egypt, this is wrong. There always needs to be a male person being the king. So therefore they deposed her, and this caused further instability. And the 13th dynasty... Um, has more than 70 kings, 70 kings are in, and in around 100 years. This also shows that there was no political um, stable rule. There was increasing destability, and this uh, led to the Middle Kingdom um, going into the second intermediate period. And the second intermediate period, very important word here, are the Hyksos, who invaded Egypt and um, caused the second intermediate period.